Movies have let me down countless times in the past, I don't know if you can tell, but none has disappointed me on such a deep level that it seemed as though it was intentionally designed for me. I had never seen a thing that appeared to be tailor-made to depress me before watching The Dead Don't Die. Spoilers ahead, as I will be digging deep to explain why this film fails to garner the audience's investment in so many ways. To start, I think it's crucial to address why I'm making this video, because under no circumstances do I want to be on the wrong side of the Jimmy Jarmusch fandom. I did enjoy The Dead Don't Die, but not in a conventional sense, so please don't label me a heretic just yet. By the end of my first watch, I was left frustrated because nothing about it compelled me to care about the characters, or the plot, or the world, or anything. I had never thought about it until watching this awkward but endearing film, but these metrics, when done right, help maximize the audience's investment. Without a consistent internal logic, we are less likely to worry about characters in stressful situations. Without characters we can get behind, we are less likely to want to see the plot progress. And without a gripping plot, we are less likely to care about what's happening on screen at any given moment. Many, many movies fall short on one or two of these fronts, but it's a cause for ironic celebration when one is so underwhelming that it gets a hat trick. The Dead Don't Die is a case study in what not to do when trying to grab the audience's attention and investment. And without further ado, here's why. The plot is pretty bare bones. The dead have risen and slowly start terrorizing a small American town. We see residents of said town, as well as tourists and an alien, deal with the apocalypse in their own unique ways. Regardless, when 90% of the cast end up dead or zombified, the sheriff and his deputy accept their fate and challenge the hordes of undead head-on before being overrun themselves. Roll credits. I would imagine that most discussions of the dead don't die focus on its subversive elements, or the instances of fourth wall breaking, or for a lack of better terms to sum up this film, its quirkiness. So quirky, in fact, that that quirkiness ends up being malignant. The easiest place to start would be the subversion department. Allow me to make something clear. Subversion is simply a writing tool a mechanic that facilitates some sort of shock to the audience's systems, whether subtle or not. It is not necessarily good or bad to be subversive, that all depends on execution, because simply surprising the viewer, while subversive, is not worthy of praise. Taking the viewer outside of their comfort zone and exposing them to stimuli with which they are not familiar, now that's the type of subversion we're mainly talking about with regards to the dead don't die. But once more, simply being subversive is not enough. Those are some pretty good cuts. You played some minor league ball, didn't you? The plot subverts our expectations by having characters react calmly, without interest, to their increasingly dire circumstances. The one character most capable of defending herself against the undead does not do the heroic thing and help get the townsfolk to safety. So the dead just don't want to die today, is that it? You see, while the rest of the cast talk and sometimes behave as though they're aliens, Zelda actually is one. Why? Well, that's never explained. Which, while not automatically a mark against the film, is but one fish in a sea of subversion. One of the most popular forms of subversion being the fourth wall break. Are we improvising here? Such as when Ronnie points out that the dead don't die by Sturgill Simpson is the film's theme song. Jarmusch will not let you forget that fact, as the dead don't die by Sturgill Simpson is played at every possible opportunity, regardless of context or whether it even makes sense diegetically. Breaking the fourth wall is like snorting ten lines of coke and streaking across a highway on your way to a brothel. Best done in moderation. Deadpool understood that. Sort of. But the dead don't die plays out as though it doesn't want you to be invested in it, intentionally taking you out of the experience and calling attention to its own narrative structure. Later in the story, Officer Mindy wants to be told that everything will be alright, only for Ronnie to chime in with his signature brand of unenthusiastic pessimism. He disenchants her. That is partly the nature of storytelling. To be enchanted, mesmerized. Ronnie's pessimism is directed at the viewer as well as Officer Mindy. He's shutting down her hopes for salvation while simultaneously shutting down our hopes for a compelling story. Quite poetic when you think about it. I cannot reasonably assert that The Dead Don't Die is not a clever film, I think it has layers to it, but while it puts a lot of emphasis on satirical witty writing, it fails to capture the audience's interest. The clever meta-decisions serve as obstacles in the way of us caring about what happens to the characters. They are not people as much as they are vehicles for various vaguely defined messages. Messages which are important enough to undergird the plot, but not important enough to warrant our investment in it. The characters don't care, so why should the audience? The Earth's axis has shifted such that daylight extends deep into nighttime and there are zombies out and about, but the residents of this small town are unconcerned, as though they just couldn't be bothered. When the human characters are behaving with the same degree of composure that the literal alien is, something must be wrong. There is a reason for this bizarre behavior, to be fair. The themes. You see, the characters of the dead don't die are lethargic and passive, going about their everyday lives with little concern for what takes place outside their quaint town. The alarming warnings and actual signs that Doomsday is at their doorstep are not enough to make them change their ingrained behavior, let alone try to do something to remedy the situation. Even in life, these people are like zombies, going through the motions in a state of limited consciousness. Ronnie remarks at how the zombies gravitate towards behaviors they had in life. 
The film aims to comment on our materialistic dopamine craving lifestyles by comparing us to zombies. While everything else about the film is understated and subtle, the themes are overt and at times obnoxious. Child zombies mumble about brands and products like Skittles, others are purely concerned with sports and business. The Star Destroyer keychain on Ronnie's keys serves as commentary on consumerism, breaking the fourth wall, and product placement all in one, beautifully illustrating how Jarmusch wants to have his cake and eat it too. Star Wars is one of the greatest historical examples of consumer hysteria, and yet Jarmusch thinks he can reconcile having a blatant pop culture easter egg in his movie with comparing people to zombies for obsessing over pop culture. It's because Adam Driver is in those movies as well. You don't say. Even the film's marketing played up the amount of celebrities in the cast, despite their roles being largely unimportant. The inclusion of so many celebrities in insignificant roles can be interpreted as a reference to how easily entertained people are, such as getting excited at the mere sight of someone they recognize in an unfamiliar setting, as though your favorite actor simply being present in a movie somehow makes it better, a wise man once said. Meta might seem clever, as deep as an endlessly recursive hole, but I think it's more like an infinity mirror, surprisingly easy to set up and gives the illusion of depth by just reflecting back on itself. That perceived cleverness makes Meta a highly prized gimmick, which means if you want to min-max the effort to pay off ratio, there's no better way than Meta. The Dead Don't Die is extremely self-aware of how it deconstructs narrative and cinematic tropes, but completely lacks self-awareness in the execution of its themes. It is meta to a detrimental degree, so meta that the veneer of self-awareness fades and the film seems guilty of the very tropes it's parodying. How is the average moviegoer supposed to distinguish between a character authentically making a stupid decision and one ironically making a stupid decision? Honestly, it's like we're all going into the movie looking to enjoy it and Jarmusch is sitting there behind the scenes playing 4D chess to ensure that we don't. Like, bro, I don't care how materialistic and shallow we've become as a result of our hyperproductive society, why does Chief Cliff not care that his wife reanimated in front of him before being decapitated? What happened in that marriage to make him so comically apathetic? That sounds like a great avenue to explore, one with great comedic potential and a good excuse to flesh out the Chief's history and motivations. It could even be its own movie. But no, after watching his undead wife's head get hacked off, it's back to business as usual. The pertinent question being, if these people don't care, why should I? And then there's Zoe. I'm Zoe. The character who is either the key to unraveling the mystery of this film's ridiculous structure or yet another example of Jarmusch's quirky writing. On the surface, Zoe is little more than a celebrity cameo, an opportunity for cross-promotion between a director and singer. That explanation makes sense when you consider how little screen time she has, how thin and undeveloped her character is, and why there's nothing more than a name distinguishing Zoe from Selena Gomez. They don't shy away from displaying her semicolon tattoo, a symbol of suicide prevention with which Gomez is publicly concerned, but a symbol that does not help inform Zoe's character. Not only did they not use makeup to cover it, there is a shot that lingers on it. Suicide, as a theme, does not feature in The Dead Don't Die, and including it could come off as distasteful considering the satirical deadpan humor. Thus, Zoe appears to be an unnecessary celebrity cameo, one whose appearance they did nothing to alter, making her seem out of place with the actors in general, regardless of notoriety. On the other hand, Zoe could be one of the most brilliantly subversive elements of the film. We're all familiar with classic horror tropes, the technology that fails at the worst possible time, the lively sex scenes and brutal death scenes, and, relevant to Zoe, the eye candy, the damsel who struts her stuff before meeting an unsavory demise somewhere in the second act. What's neat about Zoe is how she both embodies and subverts this trope. She has about as much depth as your typical horror movie damsel, more comparable to a kiddie's pool than anything resembling human, and she goes out almost exactly as you'd expect her to. But before I get to how and why No Country for Old Men did this same scene better, allow me to address this. Yeah, Cleveland. Thanks. How did that make you feel? Me? I'm confused. Why have the camera follow Zoe in a wide-angle shot all the way into her motel room? I would say she's clearly uncomfortable with the way the men, and thus we the audience, are looking at her. But as with most of Jarmusch's execution, Zoe's look of discomfort is subtle, extremely easy to miss, and yet we can infer a lot from it. Selena Gomez is considered to be wasted talent in the film. I disagree. I think she was very deliberately used as a satire of damsels in horror films. Her anticlimactic off-screen death was a meta cockblock for the horror fans accustomed to seeing her type of character teasing the viewer, then naked, then screaming before and while she dies. Zoe is played up as eye candy only for the trope to be subverted by her not appearing in a sex scene or dying like a damsel on screen. She takes a lengthy enough stroll that we're allowed to imagine what the plot has in store for her. And it's nothing. We don't even know how she spent her final moments, and the script does as much as possible to disrespect her memory. 
The first time I saw this shot, I was reminded of No Country for Old Men, for obvious reasons. However, that film is a contemplation on existential dread, not a parody. When the sheriff finds Moss dead at the motel, it feeds into his foreboding dream, which has no conclusion, no catharsis. The entire film is a meditation on disappointment, part of what makes it so satisfying. When Well subverts Moss's heroic ambitions in the hospital, it reinforces our investment in the plot, now, not only have we seen this average Joe struggle against a deranged hitman, we are told by someone who knows Sugar personally that Moss has no hope. Traditionally, the naysayer would be proven wrong in the end, but not here. That film had to work hard for the subversion it dropped on us. The Dead Don't Die tries to have fun with the same concept that no country took extremely seriously. The results speak for themselves. Then I woke up. Now they're just dead hipsters from Cleveland. Sure, these two films are rather tonally distinct, but what I'm getting at, once more, is the execution. As horror comedies go, The Dead Don't Die is a remarkable failure. If genuine laughter is the equivalent of a strong gust of wind, then it gave me cause to expel a few feeble farts. It suffers from its overly dry and lifeless humor, so understated that it might as well not be there. It's pretentious in the least offensive manner I've ever seen, such that it ends up more unpleasant than downright egregious. While it's an interesting origin story for the zombies, to have them be brought about by a shift in the Earth's axis out to polar fracking, it seems like a lazily strung together reason to have a climate change message in the film. Not to mention, the rules for zombification are incongruous for the sake of whatever the plot needs to happen. Some zombies rise from their graves and immediately seek out flesh, and others just mumble and bat their eyes for the audience. After being bitten and not fully consumed, the dead diner goers do not reanimate while every other instance of a bite leads to zombification. This film was almost a deeply nuanced yet logically compromised deconstruction of storytelling. But then there's Farmer Miller. I don't need to show a clip for you to get the idea. This visual is potent. Perhaps the liveliest character in this whole film has no redeeming qualities, accompanied by an indiscreet political affiliation. As if it wasn't easy enough to dislike him already, the director thought this would be a good touch. And his character is contrasted with the humble Hank, who just so happens to be black. Their relationship could not be any more contrived for millennial sensibilities. Miller, being the rational, ordinary human he is, makes sure that the first thing he grabs after being disturbed in the middle of the night is his gun. That all checked out. But then, the second thing he gets after being strangled by a walking corpse is not more ammo or emergency supplies. Hell, he doesn't even get dressed for combat. He just puts on his hat. How subversive. For how subtle he is the rest of the time, Jarmusch seems to be letting his poker face slip here. As soon as you ask a fan of the dead don't die what was good about it, they can always fall back on commentary on materialism, or commentary on climate change, as though those ancillary aspects of its design make up for an utter lack of stakes or intrigue. Well, intrigue might be there in the first viewing, and will likely be followed by disappointment and a yearning to turn back the clock 104 minutes. Most negative reviews of The Dead Don't Die cite the bland humor, directionless plot, uninteresting characters, and inconsistent zombie mechanics. Whereas the positive reviews that I've seen cite, and I quote, Suppressed terror. The horror lurks beneath the surface and is subtle. I love how they drank coffee while their victims moaned off screen. So unique. The climate change message. I loved blank scene. Subversive and unique how the climax show Cliff and Ron facing off not against faceless hordes, but against the characters we've been getting to know over the course of the film. I just think it's really cool. The didactic nature of the commentary, intended to teach the audience about their mindless materialism, about how complacent and lackadaisical we are in the face of impending doom, such as climate change. But really, I don't mean to sell the movie short, it has merits. Instead of torrents of red blood spilling out of zombies when they're damaged, there are puffs of black mist, which is probably more consistent with the science, I don't know, I just think it's one of the cooler genre subversions on offer. When night finally comes, the zombies attack with no dramatic build-up or jump scare. Underwhelming, yes, but I'm a sucker for a consistency. The only people who survive the film are those outside of the quote-unquote system, Hermit Bob and the kids in juvie. This furthers the social critique and adds an admittedly compelling element to the plot. Hermit Bob and the kids are not involved in society. They're outside of our conventional social structures, by choice or not, and are thus far less likely to be guilty of the consumer lifestyle Jarmusch so eloquently compares to being a zombie. Wi-Fi. Xanax. Bluetooth. Siri. Coffee. Guitar. 
For being observers rather than participants, they survive. And the final positive criticism I will address, which is less criticism than it is cause for facepalm and eye roll, has to do with a man named Brecht. You see, Bertolt Brecht was an early 20th century German playwright and poet. Inspired by Marx's philosophy on materialism and social organization, he believed that cathartic writing left audiences complacent and that exposing the constructed nature of society by calling attention to the constructed nature of storytelling would help people recognize flaws in systems and institutions they had become so accustomed to. He aimed to turn art into a tool for social change by breaking down and away from storytelling tradition. Like Brecht, Jarmusch aimed to send a message first and tell a story second. Or not at all, you can never be sure with these society people. Characters say spoilers for the plot they are in. Many situations are not granted the respect they deserve. The delivery of comedy is flat and dry, and things happen with no apparent cause or effect. His hope was that by disrupting the audience's suspension of disbelief, they would be encouraged to think about the message of the play without being distracted by their empathy for the characters. A perfect summary of the dead don't die if I ever heard one. What, what the hell was it? A wild animal? Of several wild animals? What the heck was it? A wild animal? Several wild animals? That's exactly what I said. Was it a wild animal? Or several wild animals? Discovering that Jarmusch was inspired by Brecht was an odd moment for me, because in my Mountain Dew fueled stupidity, I thought that the dead don't die is meandering, dreary, and overall mediocre by accident. But this guy put everything in perspective for me. It's supposed to be that way, because as far as some people are concerned, telling a story is not as important as sending a message. Which I actually have no problem with, and as far as some other people are concerned, telling a story is optional as long as you have a message to send at all. Even the great Hermes would have trouble limboing under a bar set this low. RZA plays a delivery man in this film, and arguably his most notable line is... The world is perfect. Appreciate the details. Possibly a reference to the goal of the film as a whole. Rather than aiming to meet your expectations for a good movie, The Dead Don't Die assumes that you can't see the forest for the trees. The film asks you to turn your brain off and simply let things happen. The irony, I think, is lost on whoever proposed this line for the script because the precise meaning of details is up for interpretation. We know it's not referring to any kind of narrative integrity, as we're reminded at every turn that such a thing might as well not exist. So all I'm left to speculate is that details refers to the commentary on consumerism and climate change, which the film makes so obvious that an ironclad case can be made for the dead don't die being no more than a public service announcement moonlighting as a film. The opening scene sets the tone perfectly. After firing on two officers of the law, Hermit Bob is let off scot-free. And, from what the chief says, we're left to infer that this is because Farmer Miller, who accused Hermit Bob of stealing one of his chickens, is worse. Hey, Clef! Fuck you! In the language of cinema, I believe that translates to don't take this seriously, there are no logical consequences, and relax, because this film is dull as dishwater. And as a bonus, it intentionally alienates viewers for the sake of shallow commentary on consumerism and climate change. Fight Club, Mother, hell, even South Park did this in a more compelling way over the course of three episodes. Excuse my adoration for No Country for Old Men, but it bugs me how much better that film executed some of the very same techniques that the dead don't die botched. Its opening scene is a sequence of landscape shots accompanied by Sheriff Bell's narration, during which he references changing times, unpredictability, and the confusing nature of violence, all of which are themes that are explored to a logical degree within the confines of the film, no additional reading required. This ship was in need of likable characters to salvage what positives were stowed beneath the surface, but alas, everyone is painfully humdrum. Zelda was as close as I came to being curious as to where a character's arc would lead, but as it would turn out, I fell right into Jarmusch's trap. There is no resolution for her, or anyone. It's all pointless. Nothing embodies this pessimistic overtone better than Ronnie's persistent black pill rhetoric. You may be misguided into believing that that's an authentic part of his character, but as it turns out, he's depressed purely because he read the script all the way through. Finally, someone I can empathize with. It's all just going through the motions. Robotic, meandering dialogue intended to illustrate how mindless and superficial people can be. Gratuitous fourth wall breaking intended to make you think deeper than conventional stories would allow. And a moment-to-moment -moment experience that would give watching paint dry a run for its money. Why, ultimately? Why not, says Jimmy Jarmusch, a man who can spend millions of dollars making a film so boring and disorganized that the people who enjoy it will simply invent substance where he left it open for interpretation. His fans could infer meaning where he implied ambiguity. 
effectively having the viewers write the script for him. My heart goes out to the poor souls who think the dead don't die does subversion better than the worst Coen Brothers film. Jarmusch's style is so subversive that at a certain point it becomes pure nonsense. When you've subverted themes, archetypes, audience expectations, and just about every narrative convention under the sun, one of the few targets you're left with is logic itself. So it's quite fitting, with all the subversive stories coming out nowadays, that films have become far less concerned with making sense. What a fucked up world.